You're listening to The Whole Church Podcast. Our efforts to educate and unite the church are made possible thanks to our sponsors on Patreon. Please consider joining them for $3 a month, where you can get a special 60% discount on our upcoming convention and hang out with us in person. We look forward to seeing you. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1-6 through 6 in the New American Standard Bible starts, Now concerning food sacrifice to idols, we know that... We all have knowledge. Knowledge makes one conceited, but love edifies people. If anyone thinks that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. It goes on to talk about whether or not you know it, if an offering was, food was offered to idols or not before you consumed it. Um, the end of the verse reads, We exist for him in one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. So here, St. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth about food offered to idols, but he makes some pretty bold statements that apply to the limits of knowledge and the power of love and relationship through God. Trip Fuller, how do you think this teaching by St. Paul could better be applied in the church today as a whole? Oh, so um, now we, for people that don't know, Joshua does so much prep for his podcast, he sends these in advance. <laughs> so, um, and then the part you didn't read was the part I was most interested in, but Sorry. it's the idol meat controversy in first Corinthians, but it, of the part you picked, I actually think the, one of the, uh, one of the signs that you don't know anything is confidence that you know something. Um, and it's not because there's not more knowledge to gain. I think it's that when talking about the divine, the ultimate mystery, uh, the, the closer one is to participating in the divine life, the clearer one is, um, about the unfathomable depths of the divine mystery. And, and, and I think that, I mean, you can see it in concepts like humility and all that kind of thing, but it, it's, it's fascinating that that is his setup uh, is an affirmation of the limits of knowledge and to claim it is ultimately problematic for, at the end, unity in, in Christ. And then the issue he's dealing with uh, there is idol meat. And you know, it's kind of fascinating because certain people in the church and in different parts that Paul writes letters to, there's different kind of ethnic, cultural, religious situations uh, taking place. And so one of the ongoing um, debates in uh, kind of especially the part of the early church that identified with Paul uh, deeply was well, what do you do with particular parts of Torah that set expectations around who you eat with, what you eat and all that kind of stuff? Um, and then what do you do if the meat has been sacrificed to an idol? You know, Paul's like, well, technically, it's not like there are other gods. So it really wasn't <laughs> sacrificed to an idol. Um, but look, if the people know it's sacrificed to an idol and they get worked up about it, like, don't blow your biscuits. Right. Like, yeah. this is not the time to go. Nope. You're being ridiculous, friends. There absolutely are no idols. Watch me eat the idol meat. And then the other person's like, well, yeah, we know the true God, but they sacrificed it to an idol. We know that's unclean. Haven't you read Leviticus? You're breaking the book, you know, and you could just imagine this fight. And both of them have some version of I, this is non-negotiable to me. And both of them have something in it that's right, uh, that they're, they're wanting to claim, like breaking your allegiance to the one that has redeemed you in Christ or right, like at, at doing something and treating another reality if, as if it's real, an idol. Uh, and, and so both of them had these non-negotiables. So I think the text actually it begs us to ask the question, like, uh, w like, what is your non-negotiable? And then what kind of assumptions make those non-negotiables for you and your community of faith uh, make sense? And can you imagine people who actually have been baptized into the same body with different assumptions where their actual conclusion of this is different than yours? And yet, though it's that you're being non-negotiable about it, that you can't actually think about the other's perspective and understanding and acknowledge that this kind of difference exists within the body of Christ. And so the while Paul does have an answer to the idol meat question, he sidesteps it. I mean, he tells you what he thinks, but he sidesteps it to go uh, to challenge the way um, different communities have drawn lines that they then break fellowship over when each side is wrestling with the text out of their faith in understanding it in different ways and in different cultural contexts. And I think that there are, um, you know, that situation is something that's alive today. And remembering that the beginning of knowledge 
is the recognition that you don't really know it all and <laughs> admitting you don't know and that the mystery is bigger than your finite mind can capture is not the slippery slide into relativism or you know uh, uh or, or being like uh driven by whatever the cultural mores is all the time and these kind of things i think we are tempted to always label the other we disagree with as their as their convictions are driven by something sub-christian and ours are pure uh and i think paul here is saying yeah, yeah i have an answer but like what what do you really think that you have the final perspective that's above your pay grade and <laughs> i've gone to those other places and i've also written them letters and when you're there and you meet them you realize these conclusions actually come out of their own experience in trying to be faithful and if you have different beginning assumptions and then you draw these lines about where you're non-negotiable be it on idle meat or not and these kind of things you end up breaking fellowship where it's where it's not necessary because the mystery of the god whose love should be able to hold these in, in as opposed to you know chopping us up into into warring tribes yeah it's um what you said was reminded me a lot of me and one of my best friends dj knows him too i won't name drop for sake of privacy but we started college Morgan Freeman. Yeah, yeah yeah me and morgan freeman started college together <laughs> around the same time it was really fascinating to look at our lives then and morgan freeman was going science genetics eventually mm -hmm. and me going up in this conservative pentecostal kind of era that we we've talked about before how certain we both were of what we wanted to learn going into college of like how yeah. he knew genetics and all this you know like new science this is what the science says kind of stuff and i'm like you know the bible clearly says these things and then we both kind of parallel tracks to where it's like you learn more and yeah there's a level of maturity of it but it's also a, the more you know the bible the more you're like oh all these things that i thought the bible definitely said might also say something different <laughs> mm -hmm. it might uh might kind of seem like there's a little bit of a, a push and pull there and uh, i think the same thing happened with him with science and it's just kind of a, it's interesting that it's not just god not just bible the more you know just in general i feel like the more you're like oh yeah no no i'm not that certain there is uh <laughs> plenty out there that i won't agree with that's also valid so mm -hmm. no i've always i've always loved uh, the quote it's a misquote it's paraphrasing it best but uh, it says uh, all i know is that i know nothing mm, socrates yeah. it's a good huge one. fan good one so great so great Hey everybody, welcome to the Whole Church Podcast. <laughs> We've already had a great start to this one. Guys, I am one of your co-hosts, Joshua Noel. I am here with the other co-host, the one, the only, the um, the, the man whom podcast was created. You know, we, we weren't really sure if, if we wanted podcasts to exist or not, anything like that. Then TJ came along, we heard his voice, Tiberius Juan, and the Lord said, let there be podcast. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're yeah. also... I definitely have a great, easy on the ears voice. Yeah. I've heard that my whole life. Yeah. I, I'm just concerned when he's going to start ASMR. But we are also joined by <laughs> one of the, the, to me, podcast legends of, of our time. Uh, someone, I, I love his show, love his work, his theology. Great guy to talk to. The one and only uh, Trip Fuller. Trip, do you prefer Dr. Trip Fuller? Is it just Trip yeah. No, as okay. long as long as you like let people know I have a PhD, oh, so okay. they hesitate like thirty extra seconds before dismissing me as a heretic. That's great. Okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, PhD, I have PhD in uh, <laughs> philosophical theology. Did a postdoc in religion and science at the University of Edinburgh, and also ba ordained Baptist minister. And um, yeah, you know. yeah, host of homebrewed Christianity um, beer camp, beer theology beer camp. I don't. I just. Oh That's God, where we yeah. met. Yeah, Will Rose, who yeah. uh, was our uh, our matchmaker. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. He's been on before. <laughs> People know Will Rose. Yeah, yeah. Will's cool. PhD, Trip, Therolonius, Zebulon <laughs> Fuller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's <laughs> absolutely accurate. Um, today we're going to be talking some about his podcast, Homebrew Christianity. We're going to be talking some about can Christians drink or not, but mostly. We're going to be sitting in, um, in in your show. You've mentioned a couple different times the difference of Protestantism and evangelicalism, and that's something I'm really interested in because a lot of evangelicals, you know, I grew up evangelical. Just assume if you're Protestant, you are evangelical. So 
interested to get into that conversation of how you can be Protestant and not evangelical. What does that look like? And how do we have Christian unity with one another? So be a fun episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and check out our convention's website. We have one now. It's in the description below. Use the code WHOLE for 40% off at checkout. You can get 60% off if you join our patron, but we'd love for you to be there. We're going to have a lot of cool activities. Shama Marema of VeggieTales fame. Not the show, the song. Maybe you've heard it, maybe you haven't. You've probably heard the Chick-fil-A song. Not Kanye West, Shama Marema. We'll be there. Also, Eric <laughs> Nevins, head of the Christian Podcasting Association. We're going to have a lot of cards. A lot of games, a lot of card games, a bunch of local food trucks are going to be there. Local to Charlotte, not local to where you are. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe you can work that out. Uh, yeah. Pop culture discussions, things like that. We're nerds. If you've listened to Systematic Geekology, you probably know that. If you haven't, check it out. Also, yeah. you can join our questions and answers Discord channel. Uh, one of the bonus segments we do if you join our Patreon. So I highly recommend it. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to. It's a fun time over there, too. We also, if half the time, if you ask us a question, we'll probably just message it to someone like like Trip. Like, hey, Trip, uh, someone asked us something you said. I don't know the answer. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll see how many if I can get you to get extra questions. Sent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, just just leave a lot of like really open ended statements so that people join the Patreon to ask us questions about it. <laughs> well, I mean, if you got a, you send me that list of questions, you're like, you get one <laughs> sentence. Holy and God. I was like, I started looking at it. I was like, nah, I'll just wait and see what the Holy Ghost says. Because That's what I do. <laughs> well, we and know I, you do. Uh, people don't know that we can see videos while these are being recorded. And I don't know how Joshua podcasts with someone that actually has a halo um, <laughs> over their headways podcast. Um, we're just we're just going to just stack on the TJ lore this episode. <laughs> yeah. 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 In the we're Discord, someone should ask. Someone should ask in the Discord, like, what was it? that Joshua snuck in TJ's bunk when he was his camp counselor <laughs> to get him into podcasting. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're going to make it so disappointing to meet me in real life. <laughs> yeah. Well, for those who don't know, um, I not Catholic, so I didn't really believe in archangels and angels, you know, they're just angels. And then I met TJ and I was like, Oh, Oh yeah, no archangel <laughs> archangel for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that being said, uh, trip, I have a favorite form of you to do that you may or may not be aware of. Um, so it's something we like to do as a, as a spiritual practice is a silliness. And I like to ask a silly question. To start right. the show off. Yeah. Um, TJ and I'll answer first. Give you, a, give you an extra second to think about it. In fact, TJ's going to answer very first. TJ, if you could put Kangaroo Jack in any other film just to see what he would do, which film would you add Kangaroo Jack to? There are so many hilarious answers to this question. <laughs> That's yeah, true. <laughs> like, how many of them get past your uh, rating, sensor? I'm gonna. I'm just gonna throw Any. five out real quick. <laughs> you have five answers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but they're real quick. I'm not gonna go <laughs> further on any of them. He's prepared. Uh, Kingdom of Heaven, The Polar oh, Express, cool. Hacksaw Ridge, uh, Passion of the Christ, <laughs> and Finding Nemo. I think Passion of the Christ might just be the right answer. <laughs> God, that's oh, hilarious. Um, I I was going to put him in. I've actually, weirdly enough, only seen this recently. Pulp Fiction. I think it'd be hilarious to have Kangaroo Jack in that. Also, I think he could blend in a little bit. You know, he, he could. He is the right style, sort of. <laughs> be funny time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Trip. What are you? Well, what movie are you putting Kangaroo Jack in? <laughs> well, I, I want to. Uh, I want Kangaroo Jack and a host of of other animal characters to do the next installment of the hangover series. So like it's starring uh, kangaroo Jack and, uh, and an alligator Loki. Uh, yeah. We get lucky yeah. the pizza dog, um, baby Groot. Yeah. see what you do is you hook them all together and then you say they're the actors. See, it's not them in the movies. Now it's the animals that play them and kangaroo Jack is getting married to kangaroo sally or kangaroo jill obviously because it's jack and <laughs> yeah, jill yeah. and Wins, then they famously. go they go to las vegas and things get out of hand things get out of hand but the only recurring human character is mike tyson because you can't substitute like an animal for mike tyson i think a lot of kangaroos would be great substitutes for mike tyson 
But, <laughs> but do you, those things are scary. But do you want to? Because that was really that was really peak Mike Tyson, and it, he is fresh off his tattoo. Um, he hadn't got into the like marijuana business yet, and he hadn't like gotten jacked up again, and then beat that kid up in the air, airplane that was harassing him. Like he was like the lovable Mike Tyson trying to put his life back together. And then now, now he's just like there chilling with Kangaroo Jack, Alligator Loki, Frog Thor, Buddy, the Pizza Dog. dog. Come on. This is is comedy gold. Comedy gold. I, I feel like you just put PhD level, like developed your answer to this, like fully developed answer. <laughs> I don't know if the graduate no, degree helped. <laughs> um, right, dissertation on the but theater. Yeah. Uh, uh, the uh, being a, a theater and philosophy double major Ooh. might have helped. Oh, yeah. We're just like, oh, commit to the bit. Let's see where this goes. Yeah. But, but on, honestly, like Kangaroo Jack is really like peak early odds animated yeah. character, animal character in a movie. Yeah. Yeah. I so, definitely watched your movie. <laughs> that sounds great. So. One thing we found that really helps in gender unity in the church is to hear one another's stories. Uh, would you mind sharing with us your testimony and how you came to where you are today? Yeah. Um, so I, I was a Baptist preacher's kid in the South. And when we, as a family, when I was going into fifth grade is when we moved to the big city of Raleigh for church planting. So my experience growing up in the church was rather positive. Um, and we, the, my parents and the congregation eventually gets kicked out of most of the Baptist groups. But if you only work, if you only go to the church, your parents go to, (laughs) then you kind of think like everyone in your tribe is like them because you're like, Oh, uh, we're Baptist. And so I guess that's what the other ones were. And then (laughs) I got to Campbell university for undergrad and realized that a lot of other Baptists weren't really down with uh the ability like the spiritual giftedness of females um they had a a deep commitment um on a host of theological ideas i found rather off-putting and were had a kind of deep streak of anti-intellectualism and all that kind of stuff um i was in college during 9 11 and that was the religious response to it was i would say like that the second conversion experience in my life the first big one came in middle school reading um cost of discipleship uh for the first time and realizing like oh this is serious and because it was so serious i was like okay i'm down and then i got from then on i was always reading theology and philosophy like kierkegaard and paul tillich and that kind of stuff in Mm -hmm. school um but then when i got to college and i was a um meeting a lot more of the church because I wasn't just, you know, deeply involved in a congregation my parents were at. I realized that um, there were large portions of it that were not committed to the things I found compelling. Um, Like my congregation, where where I was, it was like we were part of running the Baptist AIDS partnership in North Carolina. So I grew up and knew lots of people with HIV AIDS and the diversity of people. Uh, who ended up getting it at a time where the congregations generally shunned them uh, when it was a death sentence. Hmm. Um, I learnt, went to the, my first protest and things with people from church. It's like, this is what you do. In North Carolina, we had the death penalty, so there was a popular first protest. And then after uh, the invasion of Iraq, as I guess tangentially related theoretically to uh, 9-11, and you have the biggest peace protest at that point in the globe and our defense department basically run by baptized Christians thought, obviously this is what makes sense. Um, I was rather disillusioned. So uh, it, after the coming back to my faith after that was when, uh, w- when I realized that what passed as Christianity in at least the part of American culture I was in wasn't something I'd give my life to or was optimistic about it having a positive influence on the flourishing of the planet and my neighbors and enemies. But the story of Jesus and a community committed to the way of Jesus, uh, I was more confident that it resonated deeply with um, uh, not, not just the divine, but 
with a way of being in the world where you're, you're committed to good news that matters to our biggest questions. And um, so I kind of backed in to being a minister. Then I was kind of not wanting to be one, but hmm. you know, you know how like you volunteer and then it turns out the people doing <laughs> it leave. And then you're like, Oh, I can do this. I grew up around it. I know what I'm doing. Like, um, and so that kind of happened. And I was a minister through for 15 or so years. Uh, when we moved, I moved, we moved to uh, California for my PhD and my wife and I worked at the largest UCC church in Los Angeles, which it, it's a mainline Protestant church. I'm sure we'll talk about more later, but you know, it's uh, the UCC is one of the more progressive Protestant denominations. I was like the first to uh, ordain women, LGBTQ people advocated for like ecology and stuff like that in the eighties and things. Um, the United Church of Christ is what it stands for. Um, it's also congregationalist like Baptist are. Uh, so the seat of authorities at the congregational level. Yeah. And um, so we, we, when we had kids, our first kid, we were working at churches where uh, we could exist, but we're kind of the edgy minority voice. And we realized we wanted our kid to grow up in a place where by osmosis, they picked up the values that uh, we find in the ministry of Jesus. And that meant going to a congregation. We didn't argue about welcoming people, caring about justice and seeking to live in community uh, in a way that's positive for the world, multiple generations out. So that was how we ended up going from, I, you know, starting as a Baptist preacher's kid to uh, ending up, you know, in kind of liberal Protestantism as clergy. And, you know, some in divinity school when I was at Wake Forest started homebrewed Christianity podcast almost 15 years ago now. So, wow, uh, that's always been a part of it. And at this point, like this past year that just finished, we had over 5 million uh, downloads and we had we do these online classes, uh, theology classes. 17,000 people took one last year and they're wow. digging into philosophy, theology, Bibles, that kind of stuff. And. I constantly meet people and hear from people who, because of, you know, building community on the internet and kind of giving the resources of the tradition that maybe aren't the most popular in the American church scene, find all sorts of people that still ha are, are still in love with the God they met in Christ, but don't have, have place in a lot of their communities. So the online has been a way of kind of figuring out how to be a minister and theologian, um, in a different way. And it's also led to being the friend and listener of a whole bunch of ministers who don't know if they can say what they really believe or think to their congregations and still have health insurance for their family and that kind of stuff. So the, yeah. it, I feel like my experience and stuff has led to where I am now. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, what is it, what does it mean to be faithful in this kind of weird internet sense. And, you know, now after the first 40 years of my life being a preacher's kid and then clergy, uh, figuring out what it's like to just be a congregant. Um, mm. I, I give yeah. my, I, I don't send emails after every sermon with my critiques. I've decided not to do that after getting <laughs> hundreds well, of good. them. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's get like, follow-ups. I, I, I never know how, how uh, detailed or what parts. I was just trying to think of the kind of things you wanted to talk about, and those were the... Yeah. We hear a lot of those, uh, or I've heard a lot of testimonies where 9-11 was a big catalyst in someone's, you know, Christian journey. Uh, my dad might be sidetracking a little bit, but my dad says it's the second most eye-opening day of the year for him. 2001 mm -hmm. because Dale Earnhardt died in that February. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that one was a little bit bigger for him, but yeah. Yeah. Major turning point. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing how different events that happen. Oddly enough, I think I had almost the opposite experience to some of your college stuff. I, I ended up going to a public university, but I was studying religion and science when I first went. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really weird having grown up, conservative Pentecostal. I think going to school and being like, wait a minute, that guy's a Christian and, and he just said a bad word. 
Christians can't say bad words. <laughs> you know, like that was like, oh, I said as at 18. And then being at a school where the Catholic group was the one giving out free food. So, you know who I was hanging out with? Mm-hmm. People giving out free food. <laughs> so, you know, I ended up with there. And then I ended up going to a Baptist college after that. So I've experienced all these different things in college. And then we started doing this podcast because of like unity. And then once you start talking about unity, the whole you open a whole huge can of worms where I'm like, wait a minute, there, there are people who believe what now? <laughs> like, I, hadn't, I had no idea. I hadn't even heard of process theology when we started this podcast. <laughs> really? Mm-hmm. Hmm. So what can you tell us about your own faith community currently and what makes it unique? Oh, well, um, we moved, my family moved back to the States at the end of the summer. So we're new to... Uh, the church, it's a Alliance of Baptist Church in Greensboro. But oddly enough, when I was in divinity school, I was campus minister at UNCG and they have the same senior ministers back then. <laughs> um, but the associate ministers are all new, one of whom was a friend of mine in undergrad. And uh, then she also went to divinity school at Wake Forest University's Div School. Uh-huh. Um, and my sister in law and her family go there and have kids similar to our age, which is fun because, <laughs> um, you know, I, I have, I'm not good at not being in charge in a church because I've always been the church planters kid, which means you get there real early and set everything up <laughs> in the movie theater, yeah. stay after and set it down. And then you learn to play every instrument to fill in for who's on the worship team. Like, and then in college, I was like, one of the leaders in BSU and led the worship team and was in a band and played at stuff. And then I was on staff at churches and all that kind of thing. So I like the, the, the interesting thing, I guess at this point is, um, uh, seeing just how <laughs> I wish, I wish I had spent a few years on the other side before I was a minister, I probably would have done a few things differently, but, um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying like the idea of going, on Christmas Eve and not being there for the other three services and just getting to like sing the songs and hear the story and light some candles and do joy to the world and then actually go home and eat with your family was rather thrilling. Mm, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And uh, if you're a parent and you know that the church is going to make a loving and welcoming space for your kids and tell them the source of all existence cares about you and you get an hour in a room with some adults (laughs) <laughs> where you are forced to apologize, the prayer of confession, and uh, in the context of divine affirmation and possibility, you're like, well, I I regularly get the shoulder, you know, hit uh, from Alicia. She's like, I'll take that, you know, like the confession <laughs> of sin. She's like, I've been waiting for you to say you're sorry. <laughs> that, that'll work. That's it's funny. a it's it's just a real different um, it's a real different experience, and I'm in. I'm enjoying it, but because of all the stuff online, I guest preach and stuff pretty regularly. So, uh, but in the local congregation, it's, I'm enjoying it. Nice. Nice. Yeah. It's, um, the different communities that you encounter in some of the different churches. So it's just, it's fascinating. I still love the community that I grew up in the conservative Pentecostal church. My parents go to, I love all those people. They're great people, but encountering different communities that, I kind of feel like I fit in a little bit better when, you know, I met Pastor Will, heard more mm-hmm. about some of the Lutheran churches, kind of interacting more there and with some of the online community I met through you. And I'm like, yeah, these these guys are a little bit more my speed, just as far as like, honestly, just as far as like having a conversation. Like, I enjoy yeah. these conversations more <laughs> than listening to someone talk <laughs> personally. <laughs> um, but you mentioned your show before, talked about it a little bit. There is some controversy around beer and drinking that kind of stuff and some parts of the church especially some of the people who listen to our show is a little bit more conservative grew up baptist pentecostal all that like you know Mm -hmm. the church i didn't growing up i know some of them listen um and at the beginning we read the verse and you were talking about these non-negotiables that people hold on to that we make a lot of assumptions about and we draw a line and i find it really interesting that you brought that up because of how it applies to this question of when people bring up, oh, you can't drink and be a Christian, you know, the appearance of evil, the stumbling block for someone else, addiction, you know, whatever else they bring up. How do you address that knowing that for them, this is a non-negotiable line that you have crossed? You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I would just say like like almost anything, don't be dumb. 
is an important <laughs> rule. Hmm. So, yes. mm-hmm. um, in and uh, I have some people in my extended family who feel that way, and in their mind, the like they are pretty sure Satan lives in the bottle, right? So, I'm like, well, no, I mean, I I guess like there you could say like in the power of sin that corrupts people that are addicted and the harm and stuff that comes from it, but um, that's also true about uh, you know mammon. I don't know. That was like literally an either or you can love God or mammon. And I regularly get told, oh, you can't drink and be a Christian by someone who's an ardent capitalist. So it's like I, I like I'm always like, that's interesting. Um, but the it, it also is just weird. Like what is actually in the text in Scripture is like plenty of people drinking, including Jesus. And uh, so like it just requires you like, if if touching alcohol whatsoever is a problem. It just means you don't care what was actually written by the authors of Scripture, because Jesus made wine, first miracle in the Gospel of John for people who well, that drank was grape too juice. Much, they ran out. But see, it's not right, and that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like you can say that it's just only people after they've moralized drinking as a source of the demonic in American evangelicalism ever thought that wasn't alcoholic. Like all the early church fathers, when they talk about it, it's definitely wine. Throughout the medieval period, definitely wine. The people that invented Protestantism, um, you know, Martin Luther, um, <laughs> the Anglican Church, like, like it always is. So it's uh, and it only exists right in America. So there's a fun historical reason why that is. But like I was speaking at a I was the most progressive person in the room gathering of very evangelical Germans and they're like fundamentalist Baptists there. They all still drink. You know why? Because they weren't in America. The uh, But if you know the history of alcohol in America, it started to get abused by the poor working class in the late 18th and early 19th century. And the social gospel movement, which was the Baptist predominantly organized Christian socialist movement where we got uh, minimum wage, a 40 hour work week paid vacation in child labor law. These kind of things is the result, like Walter Rausch and Bush, these people. One of the important parts of the social gospel movement was prohibition. And and part of it was because people in factories were being worked to their body in pain, intense pain. And when you have been abused in the workspace and get home, what numbs the pain was alcohol. And then people that are bearing the burden of, of an, an exploitative economic system uh, then numb their pain with alcohol and beat their kids and wives. And so part of the social gospel movement in in uh, American Christianity was the prohibition of alcohol and the demonizing of it. Now, if it if its experience was uh, part of uh, if 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 that if that interpretation is connected to abuse of children and your family, then, yeah, don't do it. But it's like it's not like what's in the text. And the other thing I would just say, if you ask what happens in practice in most of these denominations, as someone who has spoken at almost every denomination in America's pastor gatherings at some point, there's even if they're officially against it, I get emails before about how I'm going to go out with the half of the clergy that do drink. And they regularly don't drink in their town or never other people are around. They all hide it and stuff. So the the. Yep. It's just a weird thing to fall to jump on, right? It, Jesus is like very clear on a few issues that we do not have non-negotiables over, and then yeah. um, each culture and tribe finds different ones. And so, I think we're actually better off uh, helping people think about healthy ways of practicing and engaging in all sorts of things. Like, um, I found out after I got married at twenty, so you know. I'm uh, that everyone in my accountability partner and my accountability group lied. They actually all had premarital sex. I'm like, come on, you know, years later, they're all like, yeah. it did. I'm like, yeah, we were in an accountability group. I got married at 20 and I, I saved myself, you know? And so like in practice, people do all sorts of things, but if they think this, uh, a voicing some, uh, ethical norm, uh, it, it functions as like a master signifier for what my tribe is. And you'll be committed to the norm regardless of your prog- like your actual status. And I think drinking functions as that way for some people, which is actually why um, 
uh, when my buddy Chad and I, when we started the podcast, we were in Divin- divinity school and we found they had like translated and unearthed um, the, some of the beer recipes that uh, Luther, Luther, his really his wife was the main person that brewed uh, where they turned some monastery uh, monasteries into breweries, like some of the recipes and we were going to br- br- brew them. Um, and in uh, the whole idea of it was the 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 evangelical industrial complex and how it functions for boundary maintenance will pick these different things so when you use a beer metaphor it actually gives people permission to know that they don't have to perform the expectations that are in that community so um let's say uh here, here's a good example i was doing a and when I was in Los Angeles, I did live podcasts once a month at different breweries in L.A. And, mm-hmm. you know, depending on the size of the brewery, there'll be like 60 to 100 people buy tickets and come. And um, I mean, you went to beer camp. It's like a late night show with uh, so there's like music and communal singing mm-hmm. and uh, uh, it opens with a, basically a stand up routine theology talk interview with some scholar and all that kind of thing, but you buy a ticket. So it's technically not a church service. So all these people with religious baggage would come. And, um, I was doing it one time and, uh, I realized these four different guys all knew each other and didn't, were shocked that they got caught (laughs) at the same gathering together. They all were friends. They all been coming. They were all, uh, ministers, uh, in the evangelical free church. Uh, and, turns out they all listen to the podcast. They all connected. They all knew each other. I'm, oh, how'd you know each other? I knew a couple of them. Oh, yeah, yeah. We didn't know each other listen to the podcast. Well, what did that mean? They actually had co- ministers they work with on a regular basis in the same city. They had the same big questions. These four are ministers at churches over 2,000, one over 10,000. All four of them had changed their minds uh, theologically about same-sex relations and all of them are tr- so scared to be honest with their congregation and how you how you would communicate it, how you'd bring people along. And they all thought the other ones still believed what the other ones thought they believed. And they would all get fired if they were found out. And then they are there sitting at a brewery where they've thought I'm allowed to have these questions and ask these questions and have these feelings and blah, 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 blah. And uh, and then there they are. And all of a sudden they had friends and allies where they could be honest again and then think about their task as ministers. And so you know, one of the perks, I think, of what was a, you know, a sideways metaphor, like, oh, well, let's let's go, let's have a podcast. And we named it that because we were trying to homebrew Luther's recipes. Uh, and then we found out it functioned this way culturally. And and there's, you know, stacks of 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 stories where the um the using a metaphor of homebrewing and beer being associated with it gave people permission to acknowledge questions, doubts, thoughts, experiences that they knew you have to keep closeted. If you know, you're performing whatever your boundary maintenance is for your particular uh, yeah. religious tribe. Yeah. Yeah. Mother Mary was the first wine mom. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. I, I thought it was fascinating how many, analogies c.s lewis used of mixed drinks <laughs> right you're just like yeah it's casual and I, I i really find it and I, i'm just gonna drop this and let tj take over but the the dissidence it takes of the arguments the same people who argue against drinking they do this of oh how can you be okay with evolution all of these kind of theologies are so new you're just attached to these new theologies and you doubt all the history of what we believed before then and yet they kind of do what they're accusing people who believe of evolution that's what they do concerning drinking where they ignore the history of what the church has taught about drinking mm-hmm. for thousands of years I'm like, ah, okay yeah and i i i meant i mentioned the history just to know like the reason people grew up in communities where their faith involved we do not drink mm-hmm. is because they're in the early industrial age in america the before workers rights and such you had Men coming home after long days of pain, numbing themselves with alcohol and beating their kids and wife that yeah. every Christian should be against that. Absolutely. And if, if it fun, if that is the enabler, then it is demonic. It's not because there's special things in the chemicals. Um, and you know, what's funny when I moved to California in North Carolina, uh, one time I mentioned as an example offhand in a 
uh, children's sermon about cigarettes probably not being ideal. I got lectured after the church because they were like, you know, cigarette money pays for everything here because what's around this church tobacco. Um, I get to California first youth trip I go on right with this church. Uh, we're camping. The parents who were with me brought a case of wine and I thought they were tempting me to drink on a youth retreat after, you know, all the tents are so you want something. I'm like, no, you know, and I'm trying to figure this out. One of the same moms in that group, uh, sends me a message later when they see a picture of me and my dad and one of the other ministers smoking cigars. So my dad came to visit, um, on Facebook. She's like, I'm real worried, uh, that you're using tobacco like that on your Facebook. It could encourage the kids. Same mom, six months later at their house for dinner. Um, and her and her husband are like, we're finishing dinner and the kids are now running outside to go play. And she's like, do you want to smoke up? So, you know, it's California. So like, she's like, never use alcohol. I mean, never use tobacco. We take wine with us on the youth trips, but you do like weed, right? I was like, uh, what? Anyway, so it is a different context oh, altogether. I preached at a um, almost fundamentalist church in Humboldt, um, which is like one of the main pot growing areas in that Northern California, though the ministers and the worship team all smoking up outside before the worship service. No one thought anything. Why? Because the whole church works on pop money. Just like I couldn't make a reference about cigarettes at a church where half the families have uh, tobacco farms. So because I'd been in those different places, same as like talking to almost fundamentalist Baptists in Germany, and then we're at a brew house, like Unless you've gone in all those places, you may not understand what is culturally uh, like what is part of the culture. And then you need to honor it. And that's really Paul's advice. Right. Mm -hmm. Like he's not he's saying, like, I know what my answer is. There's no idol. So the meat's perfectly fine. Like, don't waste it. Like, you don't have to like it's not that big a deal. Like, so, you know, I'm speaking of this big Methodist thing in a few weeks and they're like, it's a dry campground. I'm not going to like sneak beer on stage and drink it. <laughs> And the person yeah. running the camp's like, but don't worry, I'll take you out after. Like it's, um, you know, so I, does that make sense? Like, <laughs> yeah. I, like, I think the text is actually helpful because Paul, unlike most of the people in those congregations, travels around to different cultures and actually sees how things function. Right. Mm -hmm. And Corinth's big problem was they had too many rich people in their church. So the rich people got together. They ate and drank all day long. And by the time the working class showed up at church, they were drunk and had ate all the food. And he's like, you can't do this until the people actually have real jobs get there. That you can't call that celebrating the table of Christ when the ones that actually need the food get there. And y'all been going to pound town all day. Right. And he's like, and if you want to handle yeah. this, I need you to donate more money to the collection for the church in Jerusalem, you know, from mm -hmm. Peter, James, Jesus, brother and such who are actually yeah. sending missionaries behind Paul to tell them that he didn't fully convert them because they need to get snipped and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to become full Jewish and a follower of Jesus. So the, the, the like the Paul is, I think, a helpful one to think about it because he actually visited and helped plant all these communities and they're in different contexts. So he's a different kind of perspective than when our our kind of assumptions of what is normative are, yes, like scripture, the gospel and things, but also what part of history we're in, what race, class we're in, where what part of the world we're in, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So one thing that we like to do to get our help our audience get to know our guest a little bit better is our speed round segment. Uh, we're just going to ask you a series of questions. The only rule is that you have to answer in a single sentence. And the only rule for us is that we cannot ask any follow-up questions. <laughs> Do you think you're up for this? I made it extra challenging for him too. <laughs> okay. You did. That's yeah. true. Well, yeah. since you don't get follow-ups and I, I feel like I'm, I'm trying to leave as many questions on your discord as possible. Um, <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. All right. Yeah, all open-ended answers. <laughs> all right. You ready? All right. Who or what is God? Um, the three declarative sentences of Scripture, I affirm semicolon, God is love, God is truth, and God is spirit. What is salvation? Salvation is the process by which God's intentions and dreams to the world are made material in the life of all of God's creation. What is the significance of incarnation? 
The incarnation is the decision for God to... Uh, the incarnation uh, is the event that symbolizes God's refusal to be God without us. What is the significance of baptism and the Eucharist? Well, see, those are two different things. It, it, shouldn't I get a sentence for bad? Baptism no. is is the church's proclamation that before you could speak and before you had a name, God knew your face and cares and that your most true identity is as the beloved of God. The Eucharist is the regular invitation to remember your own God belovedness and be nourished by that love for the living out of that love in your life. What authority does scripture have? What authority does it have? Uh, scripture's authority is based on the faithful testimony of the people of Israel and the early church to the God who brought Israel out of slavery and raised Jesus from the dead. Hmm. What authority does tradition have? Tradition is the community uh, or the tradition uh, tradition's authority is the community of those whose experience of God is mediated by Jesus. Oh, let's see, well, how would I make that sense? Uh, let's see. The, oh, the tradition is a set of questions that those whose experience of God is mediated by Jesus have continued to ask. And as a uh, tradition, it gives us both dignities and disasters that we inherit, revision, and pass on in love. What are your views on destiny or predestination? Um, destiny or pre... Um, well, I said earlier, God has refused to be God without us, and the God of love has refused to coerce us because love is required for genuine... Or freedom is required for genuine love. So what is destined is the infinite God of love's faithfulness, but not a particular destination because... Our cooperation in response to God cannot be determined and freedom be preserved. Hmm. Can God change? Yes, that's because it says so in the Bible. What do you love about the Bible? My favorite parts of, this, uh, of the Bible are the narratives and the Psalms. How do we relate to God? Uh, moment to moment, each of us are met with the possibilities or the grace of God and we get to respond consciously or unconsciously uh, to the gift of the new moment to moment. How many of the seven sacraments do you or your church hold to and which ones? Well, the free church definitely focuses on the Protestant too. I mean, I know the Lutherans get the half seas, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, a baptism and the Eucharist. Um, but you know, mo you know, multiple of the others we have, we just don't call them sacraments because Protestants were like, they're only a sacrament if Jesus instituted it. So, uh, but I actually think it's smart. This, this is not one sentence. Uh, two is the answer, but I think it's smart to s s uh, ritualize the intentions of all seven. Mm. Mm. All right. Listen, I'm sure if a lot of our audience were placing bets, which they wouldn't because they would never gamble. Uh, <laughs> they would have said you missed more. Oh, man, I, uh, yeah, I that was impressive. Some of those yeah, answers were they yeah, excellent, really impressive sentences. It just was just you just take those and just quote them, by <laughs> minute. make a whole Instagram post. Um, <laughs> so, Trip, you mentioned on your show, and I talked about it earlier, the difference of being evangelical and being Protestant. Could you just go ahead and unpack that? Just go wild. <laughs> oh yeah, well, so if I if it's the one I think you were talking about, um. This is a conversation that uh, Ryan Burge, who's a sociologist of religion, and I have kept picking up. And part of it is because, you know, even the label evangelical means something in different places, right? In Germany, evangelical just means Protestant. Um, there's Catholic faculty at a divinity school and the evangelical faculty. And in the evangelical factor, fac faculty, you would have every part of the theological spectrum. It just means they're protestant and the even that's what evangelical means there um in america the idea of saying protestant really came about because uh one the public square uh tends to make normative uh conservative white evangelicalism for as the only kind of really expression of christianity in 
um, in a Protestant Christianity in America. And so uh, the but numerically, there's about as many um, mainline Protestants or, uh, as there are evangelicals. Um, and so the it was like, how do you distinguish between the two? The desire to to use the word Protestant in part is uh, the word evangelical has switched from primarily being a religious identification to a political one. Right. So if you do big uh, studies, you'll have people of every other religion, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, identifying as evangelical Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, Jews. And that's because they know the word evangelical right now has come to mean in the public square, basically like Trumpistan. Uh, and, uh, and if you look at the uh, surveying of those who identify as evangelical, the percentage chance they actually go to church has gone down dramatically. Now, has the number of people that identify as evangelical still identify as evangelical that went to church dropped? Not exactly. Um, they aren't keeping their children as much. But um, like if you were a boomer and were an evangelical that went to church, you tend to still go. It's just now you have a lot of your friends who are also boomers and older who uh, are, well, and we mean white uh, evangelicals who use the lab who are evangelical now, even though they don't really go to church. They just know that this is part of the, the labels we use to identify ourselves. Um, and, you know, there was a time where the evangelical meant something explicitly theologically, but, you know, if you took the, you know, there's three or four big definitions of evangelicalism at the end of the 20th century. Um, and you just went and who, who believed it, um, you'd, large portions of the black church would pass the evangelical theological test and uh, they would not have a non-negotiable at even, you know, thinking, how could you even be an evangelical Christian and, you know, vote for Barack Obama? How could you even do that? Well, what was the difference between the white church where that has become more and more normative all the way to Donald Trump and company versus uh, a black church that still believes all the same theological things and it's like, what you you're asking me how how I could not vote for that guy. So uh, over time in the data as to and this is this is not a theological statement. It's just here's how our public square functions. Evangelical has been has turned into something that's primarily an, an uh, political identity first and then a religious one. And it is an identity with its political identity is only true for its. Uh, you know, at least in a predominant way with its uh, with white Americans who are evangelical, because it's not the case uh, for uh, people of color that believe the same thing. So in hopes to go um, these kind that your political identity is so tied to your theological commitments, and they obviously make sense to break with it. The idea was to use the word Protestant like it used to use mainline Protestant when the kind of the dominant uh, Protestant uh, churches in America were like the United Methodist, United Church of Christ, the Episcopal Church, um, the Lutherans, these kind of denominations were the biggest until um, a large number of people left them because they took stands for integration of the schools against Vietnam, um, support of the civil rights movement, these kind of things. When those which were the dominant religious groups in white religion in America took certain ethical stands. Then those group, those people that were like, no basket, I don't care if I don't, I don't care what, what our leaders are saying about these issues. Um, I'm more of an American or I'm more of, you know, a free marketeer than I am, you know, listening to our ethicists. Then um, you get the emergence of, of evangelicalism. And then over time it became more and more of a political identity. And so like in lieu of going, oh, I'm Lutheran or I'm Methodist or I'm UCC or I'm that other kind of Baptist that's mainline or whatever, using the phrase Protestant, um, I think is helpful because all of those churches, uh, like your Christian identity is centered like Protestants always have on wrestling uh, with scripture, uh, the practice of baptism and the Eucharist. And fidelity to that wrestling and those practices um, is uh, consistently in those denominations, uh, something that doesn't, you know, obligate you 
to the kind of, you know, current expression of politics that dominates the religious right. And uh, and I think because when mainline Protestantism, I think 1950 was peak. Right. And you had its theologians on Time magazine and this kind of thing. Uh, then the product, the primary way you understood your religious identity was within a denomination. And, and you're a lot of them at that point, you're only two or three generations from being new Americans. So like if you go, there's lots of Lutherans in the, in Minnesota. Why? Well, guess who moved there? Uh, there are a lot of Norwegians. Right. So the but as you became more American, as we started to move more and where you came from in the old world in scare quotes uh, didn't determine so much about your uh, particular denomination, where you lived and that kind of thing. Um, there, the differences between the two tend to really matter for clergy, right? Who have particular opinions about the Eucharist or something we all fought about in the 17th century as versions of Protestants. Um, but I think in the public square today, it's a lot, it's more helpful to, to use a marker that identifies a rather large portion of the country who have uh, deep religious commitments and it's not what is regularly recognized um, there. Does that, does that make sense? I No, that makes perfect sense. And one of the more fascinating things to me over the last couple of years, uh, Barna and a couple other of your you know, church statistics groups did the studies, asked people questions and found that the black evangelical church is the one that knows the Bible the most, reads mm -hmm. their Bible the most, preaches from the Bible the most, and yet they don't vote at all how we typically think of people voting when you say evangelical. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it was really interesting. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't think that actually means necessarily they I, – I don't – I think I'm right, obviously, but I don't think it's – I don't think that means if you don't agree with me, you have to, uh, you know – it, the implicit bit of it isn't everyone that disagrees with me is really an ignoramus racist. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's just no. your friends with them. No, I'm just, you know, what no. I mean? it, but <laughs> yeah. the, but it, I do think it's important for those of us who have deep commitments to the faith and they're regularly ignored in the public square to figure out how to articulate um, our collective and the, because we were so tied to a time of thriving in um, the past where denominations function. The same as like, that was like when it helped to know what, like you went to every town and every Methodist church, wherever you were in the country, kind of looked the same, sounded the same and did the same <laughs> thing, probably the same curriculum. Ministers yeah. all went to the same seminaries. Same kind of thing like where you're like, oh, I love McDonald's. It tastes the same everywhere in the world. And it does, mm -hmm. sadly. But, um, and that used to be like a huge asset. But now, you know, your people when they travel aren't like, oh, I'm so glad this place has a Burger King. You know, <laughs> uh, they're the people don't make decisions with a kind of brand or institution loyalty in the same way. Um, yeah. So you don't when you go to other countries, you don't try like the unique McDonald's items is what you're saying. Is I mean, the general gist of that statement, I try to avoid McDonald's in every country. Um and then if I end up going, it's probably because it's across the street from the hotel and I drank too much and I like Egg McMuffins. Or oh. a kid is like, Ad, I want a Happy Meal. And then I'm like, <laughs> they must have put ads on YouTube. I love Happy Meals. So a lot of people have left the evangelical church because of church hurt or bad theology. Uh, we spend a lot of time addressing evangelicals and how they can reach out to those who have left the church. But I was wondering if you had any words of healing or wisdom for how those who have been hurt or left can still be in unity with the Christian community as a whole. Yeah. Um, well, I would just say if I if I had that concern and was you know thinking of let's say you're a youth minister and former students have no interest in uh, the community that you came from, one I wouldn't necessarily take it personal um, because they could have. It, it may not have been about you. And I think a lot of parents, grandparents, pe leaders in church take someone leaving or going a different direction stuff personally as if it was a failure. But you don't know. And they're only where they are at that moment. Who knows where they'll be in the future? But so much of engagement, if if your assumption is uh, like they left 
because of something that's about me or something I think is, you know, uh, required for their, you know, to, them to avoid eternal conscious torment and or anything like that, then you're the way you relate to those individuals, uh, probably not going to be received great. Um, and so I mean, I, I would go, I would ask if you're going to talk to them about, it, I would ask questions and then listen to their experiences and let them know that you understand their experience and stuff like that. Uh, and I would do that multiple times before you decide to speak into it or tell them what you think. Um, they probably left because they did a good job picking up what your community was communicating um, or what it was not communicating about. Right. So the one element I would think is that unity requires recognition of the other in their difference. And uh, oftentimes more communities that have uh, anxiety around difference use unity as a justification for demanding sameness, be it in aesthetic, in practice, in beliefs, and this kind of thing. Um, and just like the passage at the front, I think Paul is trying to generate a kind of unity in the church where there are different answers to these different questions. And he's collecting money from this congregation for another part of the church that doesn't think he's good enough um, and that kind of thing. Uh, the, the other part I would say is that silence um, is also a form of communication. And when we're silent around things, which are often the reasons people say they leave, and some of them could be theological reasons, but often at this point uh, in the current mass exodus, so much of it is the, the church's silence around ethical issues um, that recognizing that silence does empower and it, silence empowers the dominant assumptions of a tribe. And so like the, you know, the four ministers who showed up at a podcast at, they're all friends, but didn't know the other one even listened or that the other one had changed their mind on LGBTQ issues. Um, that, con that group, uh, a few months later, we were, after that had an email exchange, uh, one of the congregation's ministers had a teenager commit suicide after they came out to their parents. And the parents said what I assume they, they actually thought the minister believed about that. And then the minister is sharing the story and he's like, I've spent the last three years trying to slowly open up this conversation. And I know I've never said anything that supported uh, divine sanction around homophobia. Like, you know, he's like, if whether or not you believe with him, he's being intentional, right? About trying to slowly do this and that. Well, because of the context, his silence, even though he never personally said it, but they know what tribe he's in and evangelical free church and, um, uh, and, and that kind of thing. It the silence empowered certain assumptions on that teenager and the parents performed what was uh, to their child and they committed suicide. Hmm. Now, the, obviously, no one supports suicide, so, but I'm just saying, think about how silence does that. And oftentimes there are people who I meet via the Internet who have assumed all sorts of things about their parents, faith leaders, communities of faith, because in their tribe, say evangelicals or something, it, they, that um, this issue's thorny. So even if they're edgy, they're silent about it, or they nuance and are vague or whatever. Um, and then the inertia of the tribe takes over. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that's happened around silence of late, um, you know, in a lot of these online groups, I have discussions with a lot of the ministers. In lockdown, so many people spent time on the internet. Now you may have gone to your zoom church <laughs> for an hour each week, but if you don't, if you are not a worker or homeschooling your kid, what do you think those people with college kids or kids that have left the house did they played on the internet and they've got their anxieties and fears ramped up and, uh, which is a wonderful marketing uh, tool for, I guess, for social media, but wh what is a YouTube sermon? and worship service going to do with someone that now just spent 15, 16 hours scrolling, uh, trying to work up uh, their attention by telling them, here's what our tribe believes. Oh, you're in this tribe. Now we know. Here's the thing you should be fearful of. Actually, what is the craziest version of what you just clicked on? We can give you next, right? And it goes <laughs> over and over. And then, um, then 
this minister could have been silent on these things or trying to nuance and stuff. But then you can't counter program if you if people experiences you as part of a tribe when the algorithm takes hold. And there I know so many ministers that have quit or are trying to quit because they got done and they're they get back together in person and they realize the community that they were ministering to after the algorithm that amps up anxiety and fear got through with them post COVID is not the same place. And they couldn't tell the truth and they refused to lead a place where what uh, these, these certain convictions they don't have are now uh, being demanded from the congregation. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the big shifts in the two thousands, um, if you do, if you track surveys of clergy, is it used to be um, in the 90s, um, the, the organization uh, for within evangelicalism around political stuff was clergy led. And then they are figuring out how to organize and leverage faith communities for political action. Um, after Barack Obama, the shift had switched. Now you have you're you're more likely to have a congregation that is politically more polarized and on the margin politically than their clergy. And this is not just true in evangelical circles. It like, depending on your Catholic parish, um, or is it a Jesuit or not? Um, the, like you, the congregations will get further left or further right. And political identity at this point is now downstream or upstream of religious identity. And it hasn't been that way for a lot of American history. Mm-hmm. So you end up yeah. where this silence and the scaredness of leaders to go like my kid, if you're, if you're getting all these emails from your, your, you know, r- half your deacon board saying, um, you know, you're, uh, you are working with part of the conspiracy to make us wear masks at church, you know, all this kind of stuff. You're scared. You don't want to lose your job and all this kind of thing. Um, so what do you do with that? Like you have to figure out a nuance. You stay silent. So the, the it, it, recognizing um, the challenge of, of unity in uh, it, it, I really think we don't, we have to take seriously how, Unity should not be a demand for sameness and silence can be just as powerful at forming our congregation as what we say explicitly. Mm, and it's, yeah. you yeah. know, sorry, that was rambly. No, 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 mm. no, I agree. That's why uh, when I go buy Hogwarts legacy at GameStop, I'm going to very loudly and verbally say, I do not support hate speech. Mm-hmm. So true. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I might actually have to. <laughs> these so days. true. That, well, that's why I'm going to buy it online. Ah, that's secretly. a better idea. I might do that. And if you're listening, no, I'm not going to buy it. <laughs> I'll leave an Amazon comment that says, I don't support hate speech while I buy the game. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to pirate yeah. it, actually. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really I have not missed mask discourse. I had a lady one time ask why I'm wearing my mask at work. And she was like, they can't force you to wear that. And I was like, I just I just don't like the way my front teeth look, lady. Now it's convenient. Yeah. Sometimes I still wear it into work. Now that it's winter, it keeps my face warmer, you know? Yeah, I wear it when I put up the truck. It's cold in a walk-in cool. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, another constituent of our people who follow our show are those who follow more in the conservative Baptist Pentecostal camp. Uh, what would be the most important thing you think you could say to that portion of our audience? Um, well, uh, two things. One, I would just say when you're talking about other Christians... Um, that the church is a lot bigger than your particular tribe. Um, so don't bear false testimony against us. I get these messages quite often. Um, you know, unsolicited three page life (laughs) advice from Baptist minister. Who's like some kid that went to that church is now in college and then sent them an episode. Uh, and I'm always like, are you sure? Uh, so not bearing false witness (laughs) is really a good idea. And like trying to understand before you, uh, um, you know, speak on behalf of someone. But the other thing I would say is it, it's also helpful to be honest about your community. I'm, I regularly get messages from people who got involved in a congregation and such, and it's not till they want to be volunteer or be in leadership or something that they find out the church actually has uh, commitments around certain parts of inclusion. Like, oh, we don't actually let women teach Bible studies or you can't be a member and be gay or this kind of stuff. Uh, being honest about your community uh, is actually it, it, the the kind of pain people have when they realize they just spent a year and a half 
and falling in love with the community and then that the leadership is being vague but then they're ultimately going to be rejected does not actually help your long term if like let's assume you really just want them to be just like you you're not going to get there by like luring them in and then telling them actually this whole time i know we never told you it's important to us that you can't do any of these things um <laughs> yeah and i mean you could think switch. of other things but being honest is very helpful uh and, and the same is true uh i mean when i was minister to church churches that were very welcoming and affirming is trying to make sure that's clear so people don't come for the view enjoy it and then they come to join the church and they're like you do what you know so <laughs> uh i just think that that uh, a lot of the the way the seeker sensitive and scare quotes things from the 90s and such is playing out uh, now uh, le- leads to people being culturally ambiguous uh, and people then don't find out until they've actually you know developed relationships yeah yeah, yeah. that's actually a problem that we kind of have because <laughs> doing a church unity podcast it actually helps to be vague a lot of the times but then I get all these like texts and different things of why would you let someone so conservative on? And then it's the next week. It'll be why it's someone so liberal on. And, you know, I say that I'm mostly conservative evangelical and I, I kind of show where sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I am. But mm-hmm. the purpose of the show is actually to know what you guys believe and think. So it's kind of it, it's interesting. The responses we get because we're a little bit more vague and we invite anyone in the church. This is the whole church podcast, on, you know? Yeah, yeah. I say nothing personally. <laughs> so d- does people like message you to see what you believe and you just don't Never. respond? Okay. <laughs> so that'd be, that'd be really funny. Never. Yeah. <laughs> I've not gotten a single one. <laughs> that is, that is nice. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I feel like if I did less talking, I would get less of those messages. Probably. Yeah. It probably makes sense. <laughs> I should probably stop. <laughs> <laughs> not right now. Though. It's your turn. <laughs> Fine, fine, fine. Okay, so one thing we like to ask everybody, Trip, is if you had to give a single tangible action, just something really practical, our listeners could stop the show and just go do it. That would help better maintain unity in the church today. What would it be? Um, spend less time on uh, social media and go hang out with people. True. Yeah. Stop listening to podcasts, you weirdo. <laughs> Listen well, to podcasts. I think those are, those are a lot better than uh, scrolling. Oh, okay. Yeah. Listen to podcasts on your way to go hang out. With yeah. 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 What car? So what, uh, what would be the ramifications if uh, everyone listening did just that? Well, they would find out that humans are complicated and messy, and um, <laughs> and those are the very complicated and messy things that uh, bear the image of God and are worth caring for. A little nuance. Nice. You know? Yes. Very nuanced species here. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> before I wrap up, we just ask everyone to share a moment that they saw God in recently, whether that be a blessing, challenge, moment of worship, anything. So oh. we'll go first. You seem ready. Yeah. But I always make Josh go first. So Josh, do you have a God moment for us this week? Yeah, uh, mine, mine's pretty quick and easy. I um was afraid we were going to, to not have Disney for a little bit. My uh, debit card, I had to update, get a new card. You know, I was like, hmm. I'm not going to pay for this. I don't want to go Christmas week without it. I got to watch Christmas movies. You know, good friend DJ just just paid the Disney Plus for this for the month. So that was pretty cool. Good of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. love that guy. If he's listening, shout out DJ. You know, I promise he's not. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So for me, uh, my God moment might be a challenge. Um, Ooh. Our other kitchen manager. I assume if any Chipotle employees are listening, you'll understand every word of this and everyone else. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, our other kitchen manager quit and there are only two other managers really right now. So I'm going to be working a lot more. He was already working too much. Yeah. Mm. So May God give you strength. Philippians 413, right? That's yeah. in context. That applies. <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> oh, trip. Do you have uh, do you have a God moment for us? Well, I uh, we I was in a very um, conse- days of consecutive emotional intensities, and woke up and clearly my face and emotion were revelatory. And my daughter saw me. She was on the couch when I came walking in, and she goes, "Dad," 
and then she runs up and gives me a big hug. And one of the things we um, say, and we have our fuller family truths, she puts her arms around and starts hugging me. She goes, remember, Dad, the most true thing about you is you're God's beloved. And I was like, hugging That's me. That's awesome. Oh, thank you, Cora. <laughs> That's fantastic. Quick uh, question. Uh, your daughter's name. Oh. Yeah, Cora. As in the Avatar? No, no, no. Okay. That's much nerdier. Cora, like from Plato's Timaeus dialogue. That is nerdier. That's yeah. that's wonderful. <laughs> yes. But also cooler. Well, you know. Cora's like the worst Avatar we know. <laughs> anyway, if you enjoyed the show, please consider sharing it. Actually, don't consider it. Do it. If you, <laughs> I'm no longer asking. <laughs> Just share it. If you listen to this far, you might as well share the podcast with a friend or an enemy, a cousin. Yeah, preferably a cousin. If you don't have cousins, share it with one of mine. They don't listen. (laughs) Uh, Some of them don't. Uh, Check out the convention website. A lot of cool stuff going on over there. Go ahead. I think you can buy a ticket already. Yes. Yes, you can buy a ticket already. Uh, Food trucks, free merch multicultural worship services very very cool stuff going on lots of different denominations and it'll be pretty awesome yeah if you want to hear our other show make sure you go over to systematicgeekology.org hit the host tab my name and tj name is over there you can see all the episodes we're a part of and maybe tj will talk about why core is the worst avatar at some point who knows it should be evident yeah. hope you enjoyed the show come back next week when we will interview the author of open and relation theology and god can't thomas j ord then we will be speaking with andrew fouts host of the ministry misfits podcast after that we will be speaking with dr jennifer bashal author of scapegoats the gospel through the eyes of the victims finally at the end of season one we will be speaking with francis chan yeah, he doesn't know that though he'll, he'll figure it out i assume email us yeah. when you do hopefully yeah. Let us know. We can work something out. We're pretty booked up. We're pretty big. Um, yeah. Last we'll I heard it was July six. He's going to be on, right? That's all I know. Uh, I think. Uh, I think maybe July thirteenth. Oh, okay. Well, whenever he decides, really. I mean, honestly, yeah. we're not that big. No, no, we're not. Thanks for listening. Uh, thank you for your time, Doctor Trip, Theolonus, Zebulon. <laughs> thank you for listening to the whole church podcast tune back in next week we'll be interviewing thomas j ord the author of god can't and open and relational theology and remember you can always sponsor our show on patreon for three dollars a month and get a 60 percent discount on our upcoming convention to come hang out with us We look forward to seeing you.